Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Grand Round. And it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Thomas Daniel as a Grand Round speaker today. Dr. Daniel received his medical degree from Harvard University. He went on to complete residency and chief residency here at University Hospitals of Cleveland. He currently holds the title of Professor Emeritus of Medicine and International Health through Case Western Reserve University. Dr. Daniel was first appointed the position of instructor in the Department of Medicine in 1962 and has held academic appointments at the university since that time, including professor, professor and director of the Center of International Health, and now Professor Emeritus. Dr. Daniel has had a tremendous impact both locally in the Department of Medicine here at UH and has contributed substantially to the research community. Dr. Daniel dedicated his career to research in tuberculosis epidemiology and control in developing nations. He has over 300 biomedical publications as well as countless presentations and abstracts. Dr. Daniel is a member of multiple professional societies, including the position of Fellow Emeritus in the American College of Chest Physicians and Infectious Diseases Society of America. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Daniel. Thank you for that nice introduction. Today, I will, I hope, entertain you and not stretch your minds too much. Uh, I want to talk about the history of this department. This is a very, very distinguished department that you're in here, uh, and uh, with, a, with a remarkable history. So it will be a pleasure for me to try and tell you about it. I have some disclosures, <laughs> disclaimers, maybe confessions to make. I have no financial interest in this talk. Uh, once upon a time, I had grants and speaker's fees, but that's long since passed. Uh, I've written a biography of Jared Potter Curtin. Now, he was our founding professor of medicine for this department, a remarkable man, really. Uh, and uh, this book was published by the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. You can buy a copy over there if you want. For Actually, I brought a few copies with me today. Anybody who wants to buy one today, I'll sell it to you for $20. Uh, I don't get the money the Museum of Natural History does. Uh, now, much of what I will present in the latter half of this talk is really just based on my memory. I started here as an intern in 1955. I've been here ever since, mostly a couple of years out in the Army, a couple of years, a year out doing a sabbatical in South America, a few wild things like that. But mostly I've been around, so much of what I'm going to tell you about, I personally remember and I'm going to draw on my own uh, personal reflections. But as I say up here, at my age, there's a lot I don't remember, so I just make it up. And what I make up and what I remember are equally accurate. <laughs> now, we have to go back and start talking about this place called the Western Reserve. Some of you who grew up here and went to school here probably know about this. Some of you who came maybe to medical school or into residency here don't, so I'm going to educate you. Now, back in the 1600s, uh, King James of England gave this area between, let's see, one of these buttons should make, give me a, here we are. between the 41st and the 42nd parallels uh, to Connecticut. Now, a lot of this is up in the middle of Lake Erie, but this land here. Now, he was, King Charles was a very generous guy, and he gave the same land to Pennsylvania, <laughs> and all the way west to the South Seas. Nobody knew how far away that was. Uh, and he gave the same amount similar land to Massachusetts, New York, Pennsylvania, and Virginia. Well, that created some confusion, of course. But in 1786, the Continental Congress resolved all this. And in 1792, set aside 25 miles of it at the western end as firelands. Now, if you go out there uh, to do one thing or another, you will see firelands this and firelands that. When the after the Battle of New York, the British went along the coast in, during the Revolution, went along the coast of Connecticut, and burned town after town after town. So when this land, the Continental Congress set this land up, they reserved the 25 miles out here in the west as firelands for those inhabitants of coastal Connecticut whose lands had been, whose homes had been burned. Well, in 1795, the state of Connecticut sold all this piece of land 
to a company called the Connecticut Land Company, a group of 32 Connecticut businessmen, for $1.2 million. Now, that $1.2 million was invested and is still, the income from it, is still contributing to public education in Connecticut. Uh, these men then held a lottery to see who would own what. Uh, they put in their money, they didn't get to choose, they got what they got. So in 1796, these people sent Moses Cleveland out to see what was out here. Now Moses Cleveland had been a general in the Revolutionary War. He is a Yale graduate and a prominent lawyer in Connecticut. He doesn't look like a lawyer to me, he's kind of... <laughs> Anyhow, he came out here, uh, got to the West Reserve, they had a proper celebration with the Iroquois Indians here in which a lot of whiskey was consumed and they fired off a bunch of fireworks and that was on July 4th in 1796. Uh, and then that was at the, in Conneaut and then he went on to the mouth of the Cuyahoga River and he and his friends, his company established a uh, community uh, here which his compadres named Cleveland in his honor. Now, the next year, the Connecticut, Kurt, uh, Cleveland went back at the end of the summer uh, and didn't come back to this area. The following year, the Connecticut Land Company appointed Turhan Kirtland as the resident land agent. Now, the, the township of Kirtland and the community of Kirtland was land that his father drew in this lottery, and that's how it got its name. Kirtland himself, uh, along with Seth Pease, who was a surveyor, moved to Poland. Now, Poland is down near Youngstown, and it is a town at the southeast corner of the Western Reserve. In fact, there's a marker down there that marks it, and that's where the survey conducted by Seth Pease was to begin. Well, when Kirtland's eldest son, Jared Potter Kirtland, stayed in Connecticut with his grandfather, Dr. Jared Potter, when Kirtland uh, moved to Poland and brought his family there. Did I skip an extra slide? No. All right, now we have to talk a little about David Hudson. Uh, I now live in a retirement community in the town of Hudson, uh, and that was his land. David Hudson arrived, having drawn this land, in 1799 and came up the Cuyahoga River and climbed up the hill to get to Hudson. Uh, he built a log cabin first, then he built this house, which still stands and is still occupied in Hudson. Uh, now, he's an important guy for us because uh, in 1826, Western Reserve College was founded on land that David Hudson contributed. He led the campaign to raise money. He himself contributed $2,000 and donated 160 acres across the road from his home for the campus. Uh, here is an old picture, and this is the old central building. Here is a modern picture. This is still there, and it uh, is now Western Reserve Academy. But it was Western Reserve College then, and it's the, founded in 1826. If you go out here, you'll see we date the founding of Western Reserve University, Case Western Reserve University, to 1826 when this building was built. So Jared Potter Kirtland grew up as a boy in Connecticut. Uh, when his father moved to the Western Reserve, Jared Potter stayed with his grandfather, Dr. Jared Potter, a physician. He was trained early as a naturalist because his father was a great naturalist. And his father raised silkworms, and as a teenager, he described parthenogenesis in silkworms. It was not until about 30 years later that somebody actually described it in the scientific letter literature. He was educa educated at Cheshire Academy. It's an old picture of Cheshire Academy. Cheshire Academy is still going as a prep school uh, for uh, boys and girls interested in going on to college. All right, Jared Potter Kirtland, in 1812, was the first student to enroll in the newly established Yale College Medical Institution. Now, I couldn't find the 1812 things, but this is the 1813 list of students at Yale, and here's Kirtland uh, down here. He took a year out to go to Penn and study our indigenous vegetables Vegetable Materia Medica, <clears throat> that was pharmacology in that day, uh, and in 1815 got an MD degree from Yale. While at Yale, he cataloged New Haven flowers. Uh, he really was very much interested in botany, and it was a passion of his throughout his life. So he then 
started practice in Connecticut, in, in Wallingford, Connecticut. He married, the year he graduated, Carolyn Atwater, and they had three children. In 1818, he moved from Wallingford to Durham, where he had a very successful practice. There was a typhoid or typhus, it's not clear uh, from reading history, epidemic in 1822 and 1823 in Durham, and his wife and his youngest daughter, uh, Mary Elizabeth, uh, both died during this epidemic. He was depressed and uh, decided to leave Connecticut and came to the Western Reserve to live where his father lived and was going to be a horticulturist. Had enough of that medicine business. All it is is a bunch of sad stuff, taking care of sick people, you know. Well, he got here, and the day after he arrived at his father's house, there was a sick woman down the road, and he was soon practicing medicine. In fact, he very soon became the best, recognize, best known, widely recognized physician in this new state of Ohio. His father gave him 243 acres of, in Boardman Township, which is just, just the township just west of uh, Poland, and built him this house. This house still stands and is still occupied. Uh, he's set up orchards, nursery, and greenhouse. In 1824, he married, again, to a woman named Hannah Fitch Tusi. Now, there's a Fitch family there. I've tried hard to find out something about Hannah Tusi, but I really can't find out anything about her, although her name here suggests that she was related somehow to the Fitch family. Fitch family. There is no other record that I could find of a Tusi's at that time in that area. In 1828, his, his fellow residents elected him to the state legislature, and he served three terms there. In 1829, his son, Jared, died. Uh, he resumed his practice of medicine, as I said, and he became an active participant in the Underground Railroad. There is a story. Uh, there were bounty hunters out looking for runaway slaves, and he had two of them in this house. So he hid them in, this, in his study, which is this room right here. Well, he greeted these runaways and said, oh, we better go look in the barn. They might be hiding there. And he took these bounty hunters around his place uh, without ever getting them, revealing the fact that he was hiding the runaways there. He found another, he bought, which is what you do, bought a runaway slow slave, went up to Buffalo, bought this woman, brought her back and put her in, in his household where she served as Oh, housemaid and uh, uh, nursemaid for the children and generally part of the family. So this is Kirtland. This is about the time he assumed his professorship here. Uh, in 1837, he was recruited to the Medical College of Ohio in Cincinnati uh, as professor of the theory and practice of physics what we call medicine, internal medicine then. Now, uh, that same year, he purchased 80 acres of land in Rockport, which is now Lake, Lakewood. For you that know Lakewood, this is on a corner of Detroit Avenue and uh, Bunce Road that runs down to the lake. It's the north northeast corner, 80 acres extending all the way down to the lake. Uh, and... He didn't, he moved there over the next couple of years. Uh, meanwhile, he was doing other things and traveling to them. In 1839, he became president of the Ohio State Medical Society. In 1842, uh, he was professor at the Medical College of Willoughby of Lake Erie, which was located in Willoughby. Now that, that didn't last long. Uh, in fact, that whole medical college fell apart as the faculty argued with the trustees and everybody argued with the community physicians who really didn't, really didn't want a medical school in their town. Uh, in 1843, he and three others opened the medical department in Cleveland of Western Reserve College. He gave the opening lecture in a rented room on the second floor of a building. Well, the opening lecture actually was given in a church which stood where the old Old Stone Church now stands on Public Square. 
uh, and then classes were held in a second rented room on the second floor of a building on the southeast corner of Prospect in Ontario. Uh, now, he also practiced medicine. And this is an advertisement from the Cleveland Herald in 1843, that year. Dr. J.P. Kirtland has opened an office where we'll investigate important cases. Particular attention will be paid to consumption. That's tuberculosis, of course. Uh, afflictions of the heart and other diseases of the chest, which he examines by the stethoscope. Now, that misspelling of stethoscope came out of this copy of the, uh, this library text from the Cleveland Herald. I don't know whether that's his mistake or the Cleveland Herald's mistake or the mistake of the person that, that put it, <laughs> copied it into the archives over in the Kelvin Smith Library. This is not his, but this is what a contemporary stethoscope of that era looked like. You put your ear here and that against the chest of the patient. Uh, this is what he charged, all right? So here we are. You can have an amputated toe or finger for 5 to $10, all right? Uh, you can have your hernia reduced for 5 to $10. Uh, you can have a catheter paste for only a dollar, passed for only a dollar. But if you have gonorrhea or syphilis, it's going to cost you 5 or $10 to be treated. <laughs> now, he was a naturalist also. And down in Poland, in the streams there, he examined mollusks, and he classified these mollusks on the basis of the animals within, the creatures within. The previous classification done by, by Shea, a guy named Thomas Shea, rather, and published in the, and had gained wide recognition, uh, was based on the shell morphology. And what Kirtland said was that shell morphology reflects different sexes. That if you have to have space here for ovaries, you have to have a somewhat bigger shell. So he, his classification uh, was championed by Louis Agassiz, who was professor at Harvard and was the reigning king of all natural history uh, at the time. But this really made Kirtland's reputation as a naturalist. Now, in 1887, the, state of, the new state of Ohio, Ohio became a state, what, 1835, decided that it, the legislature decided we needed a survey of all the natural resources in Ohio, the, the geology, the, the mineral resources, the trees, the birds, the plants, whatever. And he was named assistant zoologist. Now, this survey lasted actually for less than a year before it ran out of money. But Curtin went on with his survey uh, and described 564 sp different species. Particularly, he described species of Ohio fish and published papers in the Boston Journal of Natural History. Now, these are four previously undescribed species of fish. And Curtin drew these pictures. He was obviously an amazing uh, draftsman, artist, if you will. In 1845, he was a founding president of the Academy of Natural Sciences in Cleveland, which was the forerunner of the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. And if you go to the Cleveland Museum of History and you want to see some dinosaurs, you're walking into Kirtland Hall. You want to go to a lecture there, you're going to the Kirtland series of lectures. Kirtland's all over there. Uh, my book was published by the Museum of Natural History. This is the Kirtland Warbler. Now, in 1851, his son-in-law, Charles Pease, uh, shot this bird on Kirtland's Rockport farm. Spencer Fullerton Baird was an ornithologist and the founding director of the Smithsonian. And he was visiting Kirtland at the time, and he saw this bird specimen. and said, that's new. That's a new bird. We don't know it before. So he named it... Oops. He named it uh where's my pen pointer button? Here. He named it Silva Silvacola Kirtlandii. This bird still exists. It was an endangered species and it's limited to a small wooded area in the northwest northeast corner of the lower peninsula of Michigan at this time. All right, he achieved national rec recognition. Obviously, in 1845, he was a member of the original board of the Smithsonian Institution. In 1848, he was a founding member of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. 
It's now the largest uh, scientific organization in the world. In 1861, he received an honorary uh, degree from Williams College. Williams College actually had a medical school at that time. Uh, in 1865, he was the first elected member of the newly founded National Academy of Sciences. In 1875, he was elected to the American Philosophical Society. Uh, this is a later portrait of him. All right, so Western Reserve College Department of Medicine. In 1843, uh, these four people started this school. Jared Potter Kirtland. Uh, John Delamater, Horace Ackley, and John Lancastles. They were all faculty at the Willoughby College of Medical College. They resigned and petitioned Western Reserve College to open a medical department in Cleveland. The first lecture was held, by, given by Kirtland, on November 1st, 1843. The school was actually chartered uh, the following March. So John, let's talk about these people, our founding faculty. Uh, John Delamater was professor of mid midwifery and diseases of women and children. He received a medical license in New... Put too many buttons on these pointers, you know, for an old man like me. There's the right button. In 1807, Delamater received a medical license in New York after three years of study with his uncle. Uh, typical. That's a, probably much more training than many physicians had at the time. In 1824, he got an honorary MD from Williams College. In 1827, he was professor of surgery at the Medical College of Fairfield, New York, a school which obviously no longer exists. In 1837, he became professor of surgery at Willoughby Medical College. Horace Ackley was professor of surgery. Our first professor of surgery. In 1833, he began practicing after attending a few lectures at the Medical College of Fairfield in New York. In 1837, he joined the faculty at Willoughby College Medical College. At the Cleveland Medical College, he was in charge of dissection. So that was a, a risky thing to have to be because you also had to get do some grave robbery to get the uh, bodies. He was an eccentric and an alcoholic and got into some trouble with his grave rally uh, expeditions. John Lane Castles was professor of Mercurio Medica, that was pharmacology. He also came from the Medical College at Fairfield. Uh, and then, then was at the Willoughby Medical College, where he was a professor of chemistry. He was also a distinguished geologist who wrote a number of geology papers, uh, and I think has a notable meteorite of some sort named after him. So the, here we are, the Western Reserve College of Medical, College Medical Department in Cleveland. And 18, as I told you, uh, November 1st, 1843, Kirtland gave the opening lecture. It was chartered the following February by the state. There were 65 students at that time, and it worked in rented rooms in a commercial building in Ontario and Prospect Street. In 1846, this first building was completed at Erie and Federal, which is now 9th Streets. 1887, a larger building was built on the same site. All right, to take a lecture there, you had to, buy, had to buy your way in. Well, here's the enrollment. The first year was 65 students, and it worked its way up to over 200 students within a few years. Here's a lecture admission ticket to a lecture by uh, Jared Potter Kirtland. Uh, you had to... Pay a $3 fee just to matriculate at school. Annual course lecture, $72. So it costs you uh, $75 to get in there. And that gets you these tickets to get in. To graduate, you had to pay another $20. All right, the finances of the school. This is a delightful passage that I found when I was going through things uh, from the minutes of the trustees of November 5th, 1844. And in these minutes, the subject of refunding promiscuously a medical student the amount of lecture fees, he having arranged for a course of lectures with Dr. Ackley by selling him as an agent of treasurer for the medical faculty, a horse. It was unanimously exalted that the faculty cannot interfere in this matter. There was, however, a disposition to return the horse. Oops. Oh. 
All right, now let's talk about some of our professors of medicine. Our first professor, I've told you, was Jared Potter Kirtland. He was followed uh, after 19 years by David Scott, uh, who served for three years. Then John Bennett uh, for a number of years, and then John Sawyer. Here's a picture of Sawyer I, I found here. Uh, and then he was followed uh, by Charles Hoover here, who was examining a child. Then Marion Blankenhorn for a couple of years as acting uh, chair. Now, about this time, Lakeside Hospital was built. Uh, in 1837, the federal government uh, appropriated $20,000 for a marine hospital on Lakeside Avenue down here by the lake. In 1866, City Hospital was built on Wilson Street, which was right next door. In 1889, five acres were purchased for a new hospital for $66,000, and here we are, the new hospital. This is what it looked like inside. 1898, it opened, and in 1908, the cost for a bed was $2.33 a day. Couldn't get a bed here for that now. <laughs> the average daily census was 212, and the medical staff from that time forward was Western Reserve faculty. You had to be on the faculty to be on the medical staff. So in 1910, Abram Flexner surveyed 355 medical schools in the United States and Canada. Flexner was not a physician. Flexner was an educator from Pittsburgh. Uh, he, he surveyed at, on the behest of the American Medical Association and Carnegie Foundation. He surveyed uh, all of the medical schools operating in the United States and Canada. He concluded that only two medical schools were considered as excellent in both clinical and laboratory facilities, Johns Hopkins and Western Reserve. Only two in the country. And he wrote a, he wrote a letter. No, this is from his report. Excellent laboratories in which teaching and research are both vigorously prosecuted. Lakeside Hospital an endowed institution of 215 available beds is thoroughly modern in construction and equipment. That's us. He then wrote a letter to Charles Thwing, who was president of Western Reserve. And in this letter he said, the medical department of Western Reserve University is next to Johns Hopkins University, which for various reasons occupies an exceptional position, the best in the country. So that's what we were. That's what we still are, maybe. Maybe second, no longer second, maybe. Maybe we're first now. Well, World War I came along, and the hospital went to war. George Crowell, who was then our chief medical officer at this, uh, later founder of the Cleveland Clinic, but here was chief medical officer at Lakeside Hospital, led a surgical team to the, to the American Ambulance Hospital in Paris. And three months later, it was deployed to Rouen, as a fourth army base hospital. And here's a picture of it. Its flag is downstairs in the corridor, like side, and that's this flag. It was the first civilian hospital group mobilized uh, during the war. Well, then it moved, University Hospitals moved from Lakeside up to University Circle here, where it is today. Uh, in 1925, McDonald House, 1926, BNC, 1929, the Institute of Pathology. 1931, this building, Lakeside Hospital. 1931, also Hannah House, which for many, many years was the private facility, whereas the staff facilities were here, private facilities were in Hannah House. It's now um, mostly rehabilitation. 1923, the medical school moved to University Circle. So World War II came along, and in the spring of, 19, of 1940, U.S. Surgeon General asked West Reserve Dean Torald Solomon to organize a medical unit. It was deployed on Christmas Eve in 1941, it mobilized its 4th Army General Hospital, once again the first military hospital from a civilian hospital mobilized in wartime. It departed on January, 20, 20th, January 10th, 1942, sailed to Melbourne, Australia, and then to New Guinea. And at the end of the war, it then returned to Melbourne and opened the, the newly 
constructed, just construction which had been erupted the Royal Melbourne Hospital. Uh, all right, now let's go through this department of ours, talk about various people. First, the Wern years. Joseph Triolar Wern, from 1929 to 1956, he was professor of medicine. Now, I was an intern in 1955. During that year, some of you entered, how often do you get to see the chief, the professor of medicine? How often? Bob, how often do they get to see you? <laughs> All the time. Yeah, sometimes. Well, I saw Dr. Wern twice during my internship year. At that time, Hannah House was the private pavilion, and private patients were admitted there. I was busy working over there admitting patients, and I, the same thing happened on two occasions. I was busy admitting a patient, and I got a call from Dr. Wern's secretary. Dr. Wern would like to see you in his office, so I trod myself over. Dr. Daniel, he said, Mrs. Wealthy Megabucks is about to be admitted to my service in the Hannah House. Uh, Dr. Austin Chin, who is our, uh, on our faculty then, will be supervising your care and taking orders. Please, when you finish your workup, call Dr. Chin. Yes, sir. <laughs> Those were the two occasions of which I saw Dr. Wern during my internship year. <laughs> Okay, so he was also dean. Now, importantly, he was the first one that organized departments in the School of Medicine. We didn't have departments at then, but in 1930 he said, and he, he came from the University of Pennsylvania, by the way, where he was a nephrologist and did some uh, pioneering micropuncture studies. Uh, and in 1930 he said, we got to get organized, and he organized us place in the departments. In 1945, he became dean, serving in that capacity until 1959. Now, in 1946, under his leadership, we organized here at the school the general faculty and charged the general faculty was responsible for education of medical students. Uh, and the committee on education was then formed in 1951. In 1950, T. Hale Ham was recruited here from Harvard and the Boston City Hospital. Uh, those of you who are interested in paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria know that you diagnosed it with a ham test, uh, which he invented. He was a hematologist, but he was interested in medical education and recruit, was recruited here to reorganize our medical school curriculum, uh, which he did. In 1951, we organized a committee of medical education and did a revolutionary thing of charging a faculty committee with responsibility for the curriculum. Not the dean, not, not some dean's appointee, but the, the committee of the faculty. And that, you know, we really, we really started a whole revolution of medical education here at this medical school, and that was the start of it. In 1952, we instituted an organ and system-based curriculum the first one in the country. Now most of the medical schools do it. All right. He was followed by Dr. Robert Higgins Ebert. Dr. Ebert was here from 1956 to 1963. I was chief resident in 1958 and 1959. Okay, what did I have to do? I had to meet him at 8 o'clock every morning in his office and tell him about the admissions that had come in the previous night. That meant I had to get to in the wards by 7, 7.30, go around each of the wards, talk to the house staff, and be able to make, you know, thumbnail presentations of the admissions that came in the night before. And then he would say, let's go see that patient. He would name one of the admissions. And we would go up to the wards to see that patient. And the intern who admitted that patient would then present the case to him, and he would go to the bedside and examine that patient. He was an amazing uh, clinician. Now, he organized, for the first time, specialty divisions, and these were the divisions that he organized. Oscar Ratnoff, gerontology, uh, gastroenterology. How about that? <laughs> well, we didn't have any gastroenterologists. Oscar was a leading faculty member, so he took a gastroenterology. Dieter Kochweiser who is no longer here, but was, actually was trained in pathology, but is, had an interest in pulmonary pathology, was made head of pulmonary section. Austin Weisberger, a distinguished hematologist, 
became head of the hematology and oncology, was wrapped into that. Walter Pritchard is an outstanding clinician in cardiology, and Joe Foley in neurology. Now, the first NIH training grants were awarded in, I think, 1958, and I think there were three of them, and Bob Eber got us one of them. Uh, he had an active research program, and he had a lab initially over in the medical school, later when the Wern Building was open uh, in the Wern Building. Now, when I was chief resident, if some problem came up I needed to talk to him, I had to go over to the medical school to find him in his lab <laughs> if he wasn't in his office. That was, he was over there often. Uh, later he had a lab, and if you go to the Wern Building on the third floor, walk down, turn the corner, all the way to the end, his lab was the one at the very end. And Friday afternoon, at the end of the afternoon, uh, there was a pitching pennies game every Friday afternoon uh, with he and Austin Weisberg, who I'll tell you about in a minute, leading the pitching pennies against the door at the end of the corridor. Uh, so, and once we used to have these annual meetings, they still have them, but I think they're in Washington now, but they were at, in Atlantic City. And I can recall there going to the, his the corner where his room was in the Chalfont Hotel, and he and Austin and others in the back, he were pitching pennies in the corner of the, of the hotel at that meeting. So he got us our first NIH training grant, and he had an active research program. Uh, he had set up a system using rabbit ears with chambers that were implanted and blood vessels grew into the rabbit ear, and he could inject various things and study the, the, uh, the uh, vascular response to various things in these rabbit ear chambers. So, Great, he, he got himself into a great deal of controversy over our organizing medical practice group. He thought we should organize, um, with our clinical faculty here, a pra active practice group. That was vigorously opposed by the part-time faculty here. Said, no, you can't do that. Uh, he also supported Kaiser, as Kaiser Permanente moved into Cleveland and started things. And our active clinical faculty said, no, that's bad news. These controversies led to his departure. So he left here to become chairman of medicine at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. He spent a year there before moving on to be dean of the Harvard Medical School. And was followed in 1963 by Bob Williams as acting uh, chair. Austin Weisberger uh, here followed Bob Ebert and served 1964 to 1970 when he died uh, unexpectedly. Uh, Austin had an active research program. We'll tell you about this in a minute. And he's the one that brought our hospital, our medical service into integration with the VA medical service. Now, Austin Weisberger uh, was an exemplary clinician and a hematologist, but he was also a, a prominent researcher. He developed a system of cell free protein synthesis, synthesis with rabbit reticulocytes. And his lab, I moved into a new lab. Mine was in uh, 354, I think. The first lab, go down to the third floor, turn left, was the first lab on the left. And his lab was across the hall. He used to come into my lab all the time. He was a cigarette smoker. He'd park a cigarette on its, on its filter, standing like this on the bench. After he left, there was a tower of ash on this bench. I actually bought an ashtray for him, but he never used it. <laughs> okay. So he also got interested. Also got was interested in self in uh, suppression by chloramphenicol, and he thought that chloramphenicol would suppress immune responses. And he came across to me and said, "Well, look, if." If I immunize a rabbit and give it chloramphenicol, can you tell whether it's making it? And I had just come from my postdoc fellowship doing, working a lot on antibody synthesis. I said, sure. So here's a study we did, and here are the primary re re immune response in rabbits. That's A. And here, the rabbit's given chloramphenicol, and they didn't respond, except one that sort of snuck through here and did. But it also, chloramphenicol suppressed graft rejection. Here, Gee, that's all speculative. I don't know why. Uh, here are two rabbits, black skin, white skin rabbits, ears, one graft ear to another, and here are the same 
Uh, these you can see are, these took, these animals are on chloramphenicol. These didn't take, you can see it's sloughing out here. Uh, the fingers in this picture are mine. Uh, so he was an eminent researcher, but also an eminent clinician. Uh, so after his death, Walter Pritchard uh, was our acting chair for a while, then Oscar Ratnoff. Oscar Ratnoff was the first one to organize a departmental practice group. He, he needed to get his faculty behind this, and his faculty was kind of diverse. So he appointed two people, a committee of two people, to try and organize this. One was Bob Body. Now, Bob Body was absolutely and totally, he was a cardiologist, he had no interest particularly in research, was, did a lot of interventional cardiology for the era, and was an outstanding clinician and very busy. The other person was me. And I saw a few patients, but basically I had an NIH-supported lab, and that was my top priority. So Bob Body and I were charged with organizing the first department medical practice, which we did. Uh, it got reorganized many times after that, so maybe we didn't do too good a job. You know. Then, then after a year, Dan Horgan uh, was acting. All right, in 1973, Chuck Carpenter was recruited here as professor and chairman. This great accomplishment, I think, was the Strengthened Infectious Disease Division, uh, made it the biggest division, most prominent division in this department. And also, he started the first MICU. Now, the, actually, the first MICU was a little four-bed unit that Scott Inkley and I ran for a while. But he brought Leigh Thompson here uh, and organized the MICU, which was, I think it's now renal dialysis area there. And we had a busy going uh, MICU. The other thing Chuck Carpenter did was he integrated staff and private services. So we didn't have separate wards for private patients and staff patients. They all got integrated in all single rooms throughout the hospital. Uh, Chuck left um, to go to well, he left to, there was, Chuck was not a very good business manager. And he got in a fight with, uh, with Scott Inkley, who was president of the hospital, over finances. And this cost him his job. And he went to Rhode Island. Uh, here. And it was followed by Mike Dunn, uh, who was an acting chair. Now, he, then Otto Mahmoud was appointed as chair, sir, from 1987 to 1998. Otto was interested in international health and start, got us, the whole department involved in the Uganda program. Now, this is still a very prominent program. I know Bob has been there. I was, I was actually the first person to get a project started over there. Uh, I did a lot of international health. I spent a year in Bolivia, learned to speak Spanish, did a lot of research in Mexico. Uh, but I was the first person in Uganda. Uh, Otto, this is... This is a sign that out there with their offices. Uh, in 1996-97, Otto took a sabbatical uh, with, with WHO, uh, and Jerry Elner was actually, he came back only briefly, and in 1998, uh, stepped down, uh, and George Naff was acting director at that time. Now, I have to tell you a little about the Macquarie uh, collaboration. This is Ann Morrissey, who was our chief technician in the microbiology lab, who worked there and set up a lab there. The lab had originally been set up uh, by the British Medical Research Council in the pre-World War II days and then abandoned. Uh, this is Ann uh, Avery, who was a technician in my lab at the time, uh, working there. Ann is now on the faculty at Metro in infectious disease. Uh, this is the tuberculosis ward there, outside and inside. Uh, views. Uh, we did a lot of work there. A lot of good stuff came out of that collaboration. Uh, and we brought a large number of Ugandans here for training. Uh, our Department of, of Epidemiology to, gave them master's degrees, put them in a regular program, not a special program, and they went on and got uh, degrees, advanced degrees in epidemiology. All right, Richard, Dick Walsh then, Rick Walsh then followed. Uh, now, the, I think his greatest accomplishments was that he did a great deal to strengthen the divisions within our department. Uh, his other accomplishment was he was a great deep-sea fisherman. 
down here, and it's Cabo San Lucas. He actually had a house here. This is Cabo San Lucas uh, down here, and was a great deep sea uh, fisherman. So now we have Bob Salata, uh, starting in 2016 to when? You know, Bob, this part of the whole slide is empty. You have to fill it up. That's your job. <laughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs>